Hello? Hello? Ah, okay. Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, this is, is it working? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, yes, sir. So, uh, welcome, everyone. This is uh, ICTP Summer School on Cosmology 2022. Um, so I haven't prepared the welcome speech. Uh, they just told me to start. So uh, now I guess we can start with uh, the first lecture by Asim. Uh, you are uh, invited to ask questions during the lecture. And um, especially those who are on Zoom, uh, please raise hand uh, or write your questions in the chat and then we will, I will read them to Asim. Uh, is there anything else? No, I just want to add uh, uh, both for people here and people in, the, in Zoom that there is a discussion session in the afternoon. So if uh, there are too many questions, you can just uh, uh, take a note and uh, you can ask uh, in the afternoon. So all the lecturers will be around. And uh, that's it. Ciao. I am Paolo Criminelli, by the way. Welcome to, to Trieste. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Erdad Mirva, by, by the way. Um, OK. Okay, my mic is on, yeah? All right, so hello everyone, and uh, thanks to Paolo, Merdad, and Ravi for uh, asking me to speak here. It's very exciting for me. I've been associated with ICTP for several years, and uh, these schools have always been a highlight of the events that happen here. So it's really great for me to be here sharing the excitement of cosmology with you all. And I, for one, am... Yeah, I think I'll do that because otherwise it becomes a bit uh, problematic. So, right. So, like I was saying, so me and I'm looking forward to this next couple of weeks with all the other speakers as well. And I hope everybody here is getting over the, the COVID exhaustion of being online. You know, it's unfortunate that we cannot have this in the big lecture hall where everyone is here. But uh, for those who are here, I hope you take this opportunity to participate. And for those on Zoom, I will try my best uh, to keep you involved as well. So maybe the people on Zoom can already just uh, ping Merdad with a thumbs up if you can hear me properly and if you can see the slides and everything. And if there's a problem, uh, please don't hesitate to, to interrupt, okay? All right, so I was asked to give a few lectures on large-scale structure and structure formation. And also, this is a very diverse audience. So there are people who are already advanced PhD students, there are people who are beginners, and then you know, different parts of the world have different backgrounds in the way you learn cosmology. So what we thought we would do in the first lecture, since this is the first lecture of the school as well, uh, is to be very elementary. Okay, so for most of you, this will be extremely familiar. You may think that you know this is all things that you learned in high school or something, but please bear with me. This lecture is meant to bring everybody to the same page. And from the next lecture onwards, in my course at least, we'll start doing a little bit more uh, advanced topics. Uh, and this will also help to set up some language, which I think will be useful for the subsequent speakers. Okay, so this is uh, today's lecture. I'm told that if I point this anywhere, yes, I can see a pointer there. This is very cool. Uh, so uh, I will spend some time talking about the expanding universe and uh, what is sometimes called the standard model of cosmology. So before we begin, I wanted to uh, flash a slide showing some useful literature on the subject of cosmology. This is a very biased uh, list. There are many books available. Uh, these are just some of the books that I have found useful growing up. And I've highlighted in bold some of the books which have you know, been very influential for me as well. So the book by Narlikar was my first book on cosmology. It's quite dated now, but it is extremely concisely written and it's a fat book. So you can imagine that it has a you know, huge range of topics covered in it. Uh, the book by Dordelson is excellent for learning linear perturbation theory. Many of the things I will talk about when we come to that part of the, uh, the, the course will be taken from this book. And uh, there is a more recent book uh, called Galaxy Formation and Evolution by uh, Mo Vandenbosch and White. 
Uh, this is, uh, I mean, it may not be very interesting as a topic for you know people who do early universe physics, but it covers almost all of cosmology as well, and most of the topics we discuss here are also covered here, and it's uh, it's much more up to date. This was written in 2010. Okay, so let's start with something really basic, uh, distances in the universe. Uh, we live on Earth, the Earth is in the solar system. Uh, typical sizes of solar systems are measured in astronomical units or parsecs. Uh, and then beyond this, what are we going to talk about? Okay, so this is our experience as, uh, as travelers in the cosmos around us. But the kind of distances that we deal with in cosmology are very different. So this slide is just, uh, and the next couple of slides, uh, help you to get a feel for these distances. Although it's very difficult to appreciate really how vast these distances are. So what I've tried to do here is to show you a comparison between uh, solar system scales, which are measured in parsecs, to scales over which the entire galaxy can be viewed, which are measured in tens of kiloparsecs. A kiloparsec is a thousand parsecs. Okay, and I guess everybody knows what a parsec is, so the conversions are there for you to see if you're, if you're not familiar. At scales where galaxies start to conglomerate and become uh, parts of groups and clusters, we reach scales that are tens of megaparsecs. Okay, a megaparsec is a thousand kiloparsecs. So we've gone up by factors of 100 million or so already. This is also not the scales that we are interested in for cosmology at late times, where structure formation is interesting. For those, you have to go to much larger scales. So this is one of the earliest large scale images that, uh, that we know of, of our local universe. Uh, so don't worry about uh, the word redshift for now. If you're not familiar, I will discuss this uh, a couple of slides down the line. What you can try to take away from this slide is that what is shown here is an angular scale. So what has been done is a survey of galaxies around us. And in the sky, you have two locations, two angles, uh, right ascension and a, or whatever, declination and a right ascension. So one of the angles has been collapsed. Okay, so you just ignore that angle. So then the right ascension is left free for you to plot. So that is done here. And the radial direction is radial distance from us. For the time being, just take it to be radial distance in some strange units. So this is a map of the universe around us with us cent centered here, right at the, at the middle. And the interesting thing here is that in previous slides, you saw images, this is an artist's impression of the Milky Way. Then even here, although you can't really see the individual structures of galaxies, you can make out that there are some galaxies. In the next slide, every black dot on the image is one galaxy. So this is the scale at which we are talking about. Okay, and this is already now uh, hundreds of megaparsecs uh, in, in, in scale. So these are the kind of scales that we deal with in cosmology at late times. And what you can see is that the distribution of galaxies, this is, these are the real positions of galaxies around us, these are not random. Okay, it's not as if you just randomly threw down points. There is structure here. For example, there are places where you can basically just see a black blob, which means there are many, many, many objects there. And then there are places where there is almost nothing. Okay, there are completely white regions which are completely devoid of galaxies. They are in fact called voids. This is another image of slightly larger distances. So in the previous slide, the distance scale, this redshift axis, went up to 0.2. Imagine that this is a linear distance from us. In this next slide, this is taken from a different survey. That one was from the two degree field galaxy redshift survey. This is from the Viper survey, which happened uh, about uh, 10 to 12 years later. Now you've gone out to larger distances. Now the redshift axis has gone out to 0.8, so four times higher in distance compared to previously. And here they've also conveniently provided a dictionary into megaparsecs. Okay, so you can clearly see here that now you're talking about distances that are thousands of megaparsec, and the scales that you're, uh, that you're dealing with are several hundreds of megaparsec. And what you can see here is that even at these large distances, this structure that is uh, apparent here it's a filamentary network. It's called the cosmic web. And this cosmic web is already in place also at these large distances. For example, uh, I first saw this slide in a talk by Gigi Guzzo, and he emphasized something which I would like to emphasize here. Look at this region here. Okay, it's completely black. Uh, sorry, it's completely white. And it's not because you were not able to see galaxies, right? Because you have seen galaxies here which are further away. So your survey was capable of imaging galaxies here if they, they existed. 
So the fact that you're not seeing anything here means that there are no galaxies there. So now try to appreciate the scale, right? So look at these tick marks. The distance between the tick marks is 100 megaparsec. So this diameter here is about 30 megaparsec or so. So there is a 30 megaparsec wide region which has absolutely nothing in it as far as galaxies are concerned. It's a huge void. Okay, so this is something interesting that these are the kind of interesting things that come up when you, uh, when you study these observations. In addition to the large scale structure of galaxies that we see around us, there is another very important observational probe of cosmology that has been around since the 60s and theoretically it has been predicted since even earlier. This is the cosmic microwave background. So this is a uniform radiation bath which, is, which has a photon spectrum. The energy spectrum of the photons is almost a perfect black body, a Planck spectrum, which is characterized by a temperature. And that temperature is almost identical in all directions. Okay, and this is something very, very interesting for theoretical purposes, which uh, I believe Marco will talk about in his, uh, in his lectures. So for the time being, uh, we start with this very uniform temperature bath around us. Its temperature is approximately 3 Kelvin. Uh, and uh, this is not it, because if you, if you fine tune your eyes and you are able to tell differences which are very, very tiny, the next thing that you see here is a dipole-like structure where now I have indicated the temperature of the, the associated anisotropy using a dimensionless variable. So this is the temperature difference from the mean value of 3 Kelvin, that's delta T, and I divide it by the mean value of uh, 3 Kelvin. So I get a dimensionless quantity. And the variation that you see here from this hot region to the cold region has a magnitude of approximately one part in a thousand. Yeah? And this is generally attributed to our motion relative to the large scale structure around us. So we of course are moving around the sun. The sun is moving in the galaxy on an orbit around the galaxy. And the galaxy itself is moving in the gravitational potential of the surrounding large scale structure. So all of these motions add up and they create a dipole. And this dipole can be, uh, can be understood in terms of our velocity. And that velocity magnitude turns out to be around a few hundred, 600 kilometers per second or so. So this is the anisotropy in the CMB that you see at the level of one part in 10 to the three. What is even more interesting for cosmology is that if you believe that uh, the universe evolved in a certain way, starting from a hot dense phase, expanding and cooling and becoming the universe that it, uh, that it appears to be like today, which we saw in the previous graphs with the galaxy redshift surveys, then in the CMB, you expect some level of anisotropies which are all pervasive. They should be there everywhere that you look. Okay, and just to remind you, this kind of uh, ellipsoidal image is basically a map of the CMB all around us, okay? So it's like the Molvite projection that you use for the Earth. You project the Earth onto, a, onto an ellipse. It's exactly what has been done, except that now you're not on the surface of anything. You are inside the ball and you're looking at it all around you, okay? So this was, uh, this theoretical expectation was, uh, was uh, you know, it, it, it was verified by observations in 1993. These are not observations from 93. These are much more recent observations from the Planck instrument. Uh, but what one knows now is that there are tiny primordial anisotropies. So these are tiny anisotropies, tiny because they are even 100 times smaller than the dipole anisotropy that I showed you before. Okay, so these are one part in 10 to the five, a few hundred microkelvin, and uh, they are there everywhere in the, in the CMB sky. And they look basically like a random distribution. Okay, so this aspect of these tiny anisotropies will be very important for us in coming slides. Uh, its origin will be discussed in the, in, the talk, in the lectures on inflation, and its consequences will be discussed in these lectures. Okay, so I have now given you a broad overview of, yes, go ahead. Uh, the, I have a question. Uh, the question is uh, how this elliptical form of CMB is cluster is formed. I guess the okay, so uh, let me just uh, repeat quickly. So this ellipse that you see here is not, uh, it's, it's nothing real. It's because I want to display for you the spherical CMB sky around us 
on a two-dimensional surface. So this is just a projection trick. It's the same projection trick that is used when you want to display the map of the Earth, which you think of as a sphere, onto a two-dimensional surface. Okay, so it's just a drawing tool. It has nothing to do with the cosmos. What is real is the variation that you see from orange to blue in different patches, okay, from red to blue. Those are real variations and they are the real temperature and isotropies which have a primordial origin, which is very interesting for studying the physics of, of structure formation. Okay. So just to pause, this is the place where we ask, how did all this happen? How did this come to be? So the structure formation lectures are centered around this theme. Okay? And in fact, you can use this theme to more or less uh, understand all of cosmology as well, because this is what you want to understand. Uh, it is possible to do cosmology from a purely theoretical perspective. In fact, this is how Einstein and uh, his contemporaries started the field when they did not have any observations whatsoever. Okay, so Einstein, there's a very interesting human history, which you can ask me about maybe in the discussion session. But I just want to emphasize here that uh, cosmology has transformed itself over the last century from being a very theoretical exercise to being completely observationally driven. Today, it's the theorists who go to the observers to ask, is my theory correct? Okay, and whereas it was the other, probably the other way around, where it was the theorists in the mid-20s or so who were the, who were the uh, dominant players in this game. Okay, so these lectures, and I believe most lectures in this, uh, in this school, will focus around the, uh, the framework of the standard model of cosmology, which itself lives in the hot Big, Bar Big Bang framework. Okay, so there are alternative ways of trying to understand cosmology. These are uh, less mainstream now, mostly because all of the observational evidence, as I said, it's an observationally driven field, all of the observational evidence suggests that uh, the hot Big Bang framework is completely consistent with everything that we know about uh, in the data. So this is a slide stolen from uh, NASA, and it's probably something you've seen uh, many times before. It's a cartoon summary of the evolution of the universe. So time is shown on the horizontal axis. And I, I've chosen this image because it emphasizes the kind of things I want to discuss. Uh, when other people uh, discuss their topics, inflation in particular, or, uh, or, or the cosmic microwave background, more emphasis would be laid to this early part. So then maybe you want to, you know, you change the scale on the x-axis and show things logarithmically there and so on. Okay, so I will not spend too much time on this. Uh, it's more interesting to actually do the things that we want to do. Okay, good. So let's become a little more technical now. Uh, we want to work in the framework of homogeneous and isotropic cosmologies. The universe that you see around you is not homogeneous and isotropic. Okay, I showed you the image from the two degree field galaxy redshift survey. This is definitely not a homogeneous distribution. There are more galaxies in, other, in some places, less in other places. But what we believe or what we can see in fact is that if you consider smoothing out the distribution of these galaxies on some sufficiently large scales, then what emerges is a distribution which is reasonably homogeneous in the sense that it does not change much from place to place. So let me show you what I mean. Let's go back to this galaxy image. Imagine that I, I take little circles and I place them randomly and then inside every circle I count up the number of galaxies and divide by the volume of each circle or every sphere. And I call this the number density of galaxies at that location smoothed over some very large scale. Let's take a scale of 100 megaparsec or so. If I do this in different parts of the sky, what I will in fact find is that the number density fluctuations are not that dramatic. Okay, and as I increase the size of my spheres, I will find that in fact around 100 megaparsec or so for the radius of the sphere, this distribution starts looking pretty homogeneous. So this is the sense in which the large scale distribution of structure around us is homogeneous. The CMB is isotropic around us. Okay, and uh, these two facts that the distribution close to you is homogeneous and the CMB is isotropic combined with what's called the Copernican principle that you are not special observers allows you to claim that more or less everywhere in the universe such a situation should exist. And this then tells you that uh, the overall distribution of uh, matter around you is homogeneous and isotropic. So it's worth discussing within the context of general relativity where we will work 
uh, what kind of metrics will describe the structure. And the metric that emerges is called the friedman lemaitre robertson walker or FLRW metric, uh, which I've written down here. Okay, so this is, uh, this is written down using certain language which this slide describes. So what one says is that imagine a universe in which there is a set of observers who has been picked out as being special. These observers, they see a uniform CMB sky around them and they carry clocks with them such that at the same tick of the clock on each of these observers, all of them see the same TM CMB temperature. Okay, so such observers, if they exist, what metric will they, will, can you write down? So the metric that you write down for the space time in coordinates carried by these fundamental observers is written down here. So these R theta phi are coordinates which are co-moving with these fundamental observers in the sense that if I am a fundamental observer, my R theta phi relative to any origin in space will be fixed for all time. Okay, and similarly, if you, somebody else is a co-moving observer, they will have some other r theta phi relative to the same origin. So these are the spatial coordinates. The time t is the time measured on the clocks of these fundamental observers, and these clocks are supposed to be synchronized at some initial time slice, and thereafter they stay synchronized because of homogeneity and isotropy. The metric, apart from the coordinates, of course, is uh, characterized by two quantities. One is this constant k, it's a constant in both space and time. And the other is this quantity A of t, which, is, which does not depend on space, but it depends only on time. So this constant k is uh, related to the constant curvature of each of these spatial slices. So these are, these are space times which have three-dimensional slices of constant curvature. This is another mathematical way of understanding them. A of t, therefore, is the only dynamical quantity in the problem. Uh, it's the main function of time that we want to understand if we want to study cosmology. This is called the scale factor, and it connects lengths uh, across different times. So if I take two fundamental observers, let's say me and the gentleman in the first row, and uh, I measure the distance between us at some fixed time using some technique, okay? The quantity A of t will tell me, at a later time, how has the distance between us changed? So, for example, if a of t is an increasing function of time, then the distance between us at some later time will have increased. And in fact, this is the, uh, this is the situation that we want to discuss, where a of t is almost always an increasing function of time. So, the way one thinks about it colloquially is that the universe in such models is expanding. This is the idea of the expanding universe, okay? a of t increases with time. So, this is the metric of an FLRW space-time. Now, if I want to do general relativity with a metric, I have to calculate, I have to write down the Einstein equations. So the left-hand side of the Einstein equations have the Einstein tensor, which can be constructed by taking derivatives of this metric. And I have to supply a right-hand side, which is the energy momentum tensor of the matter content of this universe. So if I have a homogeneous and isotropic space-time, it turns out that the structure of the energy momentum tensor has, is very restricted. And it must take this diagonal form where the first quantity, the zero, zero element, is related to the energy density of the fluid that you're talking about. The uh, diagonal three elements on the spatial uh, coordinates are related to the, they are equal to the pressure of this fluid. And both the energy density and the pressure have to be independent of the spatial coordinates in, these, in this coordinate system. Okay, so this is the restriction imposed by homogeneity and isotropy. Uh, so rho is the energy density, P is the pressure. The relation between energy density and pressure is not known a priori, it has to be supplied. So this is called an equation of state, and an equation of state has to be given in order to be able to solve equations. Okay, so this is the broad framework uh, which, in which we will work. Okay, so let's do a little bit more with, the, with this space time. What you can mathematically prove is that something very interesting happens to photons which travel in this space-time. Okay, so in order to do this, I actually don't need Einstein's equations. Once I write down this metric, I can ask how do photons propagate? What happens if I have a source of photons, which uh, you know, I switch on a light bulb at a particular time, at a particular location, and I view the photons that are traveling from this light bulb at some later time, at some later position. And now I can do this mathematically using this metric, and something very interesting happens. 
uh, it turns out that the wavelength of these photons changes according to the scale factor. It changes proportionally to the scale factor. So in an expanding universe, the wavelength increases with time. Okay, so this is very interesting because wavelengths of photons are something that you can observe in spectrometers in the lab sitting on Earth. So if I have a very distant, uh, let's say I have a distant galaxy and it is emitting photons or some distant object, the wavelength, and if I know that it is supposed to be emitting uh, photons of a particular wavelength because I understand the physics which generates these photons, okay? So my knowledge of basic physics, of atomic physics, might be able to tell me that the wavelength at emission must be something. With this information, if I now observe photons from this object and I see that they have a different wavelength, I get an observational handle on how much the universe has expanded from the time that those photons were emitted to the time at which they were received. And the way this is conventionally done is to define a quantity Z, which is the relative shift in the photon wavelength. It is the wavelength at, uh, that I observe minus the expected wavelength divided by the expected wavelength. And this, in the calculation that I have not shown you, but can be done using this metric, using photon propagation, is related to the scale factor using this relation here. So this Z, which is the redshift, is just 1 over A minus 1. Okay, it's a very simple relation and you can prove this uh, very rigorously. So this is extremely nice because it gives you an observational handle on cosmology. Okay, so this is the key idea that is used in uh, studying distances in cosmology. The other idea, of course, is your usual special relativity notion that time and distance are related to each other because the speed of light is finite. Okay, so if, uh, if I have an object which is further away, then it will obviously take more time for light to be sent to me as compared to an object that is, that is relatively nearby. So in this sense, cosmological distance, redshift, and epoch of cosmology, the time at which certain events have happened, are all related to each other. Okay, so I can use tracers, which are bright enough that I can see them at large distances, to tell me not only how far away things are, but also how much time has evolved since those tracers were uh, emitting light. Okay, so now with this idea of redshift, FLRW spacetime, and the Einstein equations, you can simplify things because the Einstein equations, as you know, in general are uh, very complicated, uh, nonlinear partial differential equations. But we are dealing with a very, very simple metric in which there is almost no, I mean, there's no non-trivial spatial dependence. Okay, the spatial part of the metric is very easy. The only thing that we don't know is the scale factor. So the Einstein equations simply become ordinary differential equations. They are still nonlinear, but ordinary differential equations for the only dynamical quantity, which is the scale factor. Okay, and the main equation. So these are the equations that uh, that one deals with. This is they're, they're called by different names. The first one is always called the Friedman equation. Okay, after Alexander Friedman. And the second one uh, is sometimes called the acceleration equation or the second Friedman equation. Okay, so I will just uh, refer to both of these as the Friedman equations. They were used by Alexander Friedman uh, uh, for almost the first time. Actually, Einstein used them before but discarded the solutions that he got. Uh, it was Friedman who actually published these uh, solutions that came from analyzing these equations. Okay, so let's look at the Friedman equations for a second. Here, I have defined a quantity H, H in honor of Edwin Hubble which is defined as the logarithmic derivative of the scale factor with respect to this cosmic time variable. This is uh, called the Hubble parameter. And the Friedman equation is a differential equation which relates this Hubble parameter to the energy density content of the universe. In this energy density rho bar, I have added up the elements of uh, all the components that we believe exist in the standard model of cosmology. But if you want to study non-standard models of cosmology, you want to invent uh, matter energy content of your own, that is where you have to put it in. Okay? Is there a question? Yes. Does bar mean something special? Come again? Does bar mean something special? Uh, yes. I have put a bar to indicate that uh, these are homogeneous and isotropic quantities. Later on, we will study the inhomogeneous universe where I hope I will self-consistently remove the bar. Okay, that was the idea here. All right, so this is the energy density content of various components, which I will discuss uh, as I go along. 
And additionally, there is a contribution due to the constant curvature of the space-time, uh, which appears in this uh, term k divided by a squared. It is also conventional in the literature to non-dimensionalize these energy densities by defining a critical density, rho crit, which is just 3h squared divided by 8 pi g. Okay, and I will tell you why this is called a critical density, I think, in the next slide. Uh, but uh, just, take it for, just uh, understand here that if I take 3h squared divided by 8 pi g in units where the speed of light is 1, this quantity rho crit also has the dimensions of an energy density. Okay, so I've just non-dimensionalized these equations by taking h squared onto this side. That's all I did. And uh, then I get these quantities omega, and I define one omega for every energy density component that I have here. Okay, so there'll be an omega CDM, an omega baryon, an omega radiation, and an omega DE, which is dark energy. And I similarly define a quantity omega K, which is a non-dimensional version of the curvature constant here. And in this language, the Friedman equation, the first equation on the left here, just turns out to be the summation of all the omegas has to be unity. So it's a very simple non-dimensional equation. The acceleration equation is also interesting and uh, I, will, I will talk about it as I go along. Okay, so these equations were being developed uh, in, the, in the early 1920s. And around the same time, there was observational evidence that something interesting is happening when I look at distances of galaxies away from me and I compare them with these wavelength shifts or redshifts. So when uh, Hubble and Lemaitre were doing this, uh, at least prior to that, the notion of redshift was always thought of in terms of the Doppler shift. Okay? And uh, what Hubble and Lemaitre uh, realized is that the Doppler shifts that you infer from these delta lambda by lambda measurements. So you take a delta lambda by lambda measurement for an object, and I just multiply that quantity with the speed of light, I get something which has units of velocity. Okay, so that velocity is plotted here. It's actually just the redshift being plotted. And I compare these redshifts or velocities with the actual distances, which I can measure using some other techniques, which is, for example, I can have the variable stars whose properties tell me something about how far away they are from me. Uh, so this is what was done uh, in the 20s. And what one realized is that there is a nearly re linear relationship between the observed redshift and the distance to these objects. So this uh, redshift distance relation is called the Hubble-Lemaitre law. It used to be called the Hubble law, but uh, Lemaitre's contributions to this field were recently formally recognized. So this is the Hubble-Lemaitre law. Uh, and this is one of the cornerstones of observational cosmology starting from our end of our, our vantage point at the late universe. The other cornerstone is the cosmic microwave background, which I will talk about uh, in a little bit. Okay. So this, these are the things I want you to take away from here. There are the Friedman equations, uh, which can be written in this way. There are several components. We'll discuss each of them one by one. And with the, uh, along with this, there is this observational constraint that there is an almost linear relationship between nearby galaxies uh, in terms of their distance and their redshift. Okay? Uh, and again, some human history will follow later if I have, if I have some time. So in this mathematical framework, one can now go about uh, discussing what happens to the evolution of different energy components in the universe, which might be interesting for us. So for example, if there is non-relativistic matter filling the universe in a homogeneous and isotropic manner, you can show that its energy density falls like the cube of the scale factor, one over a cubed. And I will not derive any of this here. So for these lectures, I will just give you hand-waving arguments for why this is the case. Yeah. So there are two questions in the chat. One is that uh, for objects under around 200 megaparsec, what do the clustered points signify? I think in the previous Yeah, plot. okay. And the other one? The, uh, the second one, what does the pressure on this stress energy tensor act on? Okay, so the answer to the first one is uh, these clusters are, are basically responses of the matter distribution to the evolving gravitational potential. This is the topic of the next three lectures in my course, so I will not say anything more about that here. The pressure that you're talking about here 
is the pressure of a fluid. So this is a, the fluid dynamic way of understanding the distribution of matter. Any fluid will be described by, an, an, as, by a density, a pressure, a temperature, and other thermodynamic variables. When you have uh, a simple system like a homogeneous and isotropic fluid, the only two relevant quantities are the energy density and pressure and an equation of state governing them. So this is the pressure that uh, you know, the particles of the fluid feel because of the rest of the fluid. This is the usual statistical mechanical way of understanding uh, the pressure. Okay? So this is the way one usually approaches uh, the pressure in these, uh, in these situations. And for describing non-relativistic matter, in fact, where I can think of even the distribution of galaxies on large enough scales as uh, as a as an effective fluid with some energy density and uh, some pressure. That pressure is actually just going to be very close to zero, because these uh, particles or galaxies can be treated as being collisionless. And for a collisionless fluid, even in statistical mechanics, you can show that the pressure is exponentially suppressed uh, at finite temperature. So this is the way one usually understands these things. Okay. So this is what uh, non-relativistic matter does. And you can just think of this as mass conservation or number conservation. Because uh, you know, if I take a co-moving volume, which is fixed, and I fill it up with some mass, and this mass is non-relativistic, in an expanding universe, the volume will increase like the cube of the scale factor. And the mass will be conserved. So the density will fall like 1 over the scale factor cubed. Okay, It's a very simple thing here. Uh, you can do this, of course, much more formally and rigorously uh, using the energy momentum tensor and so on. The radiation, uh, so if there is a uniform radiation bath, we want to describe such a component because we know that the cosmic microwave background exists. Okay, so let's uh, keep track of a radiation bath, which is also homogeneous and isotropic. You can show that the energy density now falls like 1 over a to the power 4. So in this case, you could heuristically think about this as number conservation, which uh, already you did here. So that gives you 3 powers of the scale factor. And secondly, I told you that photons propagating in an expanding universe will have their wavelengths increasing with time uh, according to the scale factor. The wavelength of a photon is related to the momentum of a photon. The momentum will therefore fall like 1 over the scale factor. So the energy density, which is the energy per unit time, will therefore fall like 1 over a to the power 4. With energy per unit time per unit volume. Sorry, not uh, I said something wrong. The energy density is the energy per unit volume. The energy falls like 1 over the scale factor, volume falls like, uh, increases like a cubed, and that's what gives you the a to the power 4. The curvature uh, f behaves like 1 over a squared, because, uh, so for example, in this term here, you can clearly see this. Okay? This just fo follows from the Einstein equations. So this, uh, this, if you think of this as something like an energy density, which is adding to other energy densities, this uh, component falls like 1 over a squared. All right. Uh, and then uh, there is also a component that I have reserved for dark energy, which I will, in these lectures, always treat as a cosmological constant. Uh, but uh, there are many models of this. This is one of the primary uncertainties in, in late time cosmology. This, if it is a cosmological constant, its energy density will simply be a constant. Okay. In brackets here, I have also indicated what happens in such a universe to the scale factor if these individual components are the only components that dominate the energy budget of that particular model. Okay, so in a matter-dominated universe, the scale factor, you will have to go back here and solve the Friedman equation by saying this 1 over a dA by dt the whole squared is equal to something proportional to 1 over a cubed. Okay, so now uh, this is not a very difficult equation to solve actually, and you can do it. And uh, what turns out is that A will be proportional to T to the power two thirds. Similarly, in the radiation dominated universe, the power law here will, the index will change, it will become T to the power half. If my universe is curvature dominated and my K has a negative sign, then uh, this A of T will simply be proportional to T. And in a do universe dominated by the cosmological constant, my A of t, because the right hand side will be constant, my A of t will increase exponentially. Okay, so these are interesting uh, asymptotic behaviors of the scale factor in different situations. Each of these is interesting for uh, different epochs of the universe. And in this last bit here, I have shown you what happens when there is curvature in the problem. So something interesting happens in the presence of curvature. So imagine a universe in which I don't have radiation and I don't have this dark energy for simplicity. I just have non-relativistic matter and curvature. 
then my first Friedman equation is just omega matter plus omega curvature equal to 1. So now you can see that, uh, okay, actually you can't see, but I'm telling you that if I take a situation in which uh, omega curvature is negative, which means the quant quantity k is positive, okay, so this omega k was defined with a negative sign here just to make the equation look nice. Uh, but this quantity, this omega k being negative, is a universe with positive curvature. If you analyze the Friedman equation in such a universe, you will find a solution in which the scale factor initially increases with time, but then it reaches a maximum and it falls back, it starts decreasing after that and it falls back to zero. Okay, so this is a universe in which the universe expands, uh, in which the scale factor expands and then turns around and then the universe collapses. This is called a closed model. On the other side, if I have omega curvature positive, and then correspondingly omega matter less than one, then the universe always expands. Okay, and again, you can write down a solution for this. And the, quant and the case omega k equal to zero, a spatially flat universe, which has zero constant curvature, is the boundary between these two, where it, the turnaround happens, but it happens after an infinite time. Okay, and uh, the solutions that you see here are actually, I mean, that, that you will get here are actually very related to something that we will discuss later in the context of, uh, of uh, evolution of perturbations when we study spherical collapse. Okay, so I will come back to this topic uh, at that time. There was a question. So the last case, you mean that uh, the scale factor plateaus asymptotically? Uh, it will actually not plateau, it will, that's true, yes. At infinite time, the derivative of the scale factor will reach zero, the first derivative, that's true. But at any finite time, the universe is always expanding in that model. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, there is a question in the chat, uh, which is, what do you mean by a smooth expansion? In the okay, I should have explained, the... yes. Smooth in the sense of homogeneous, my apologies. So when I say smooth, I mean homogeneous. So this is the expansion of a homogeneous and isotropic universe uh, in the presence of a homogeneous and isotropic set of uh, energy density components. Another question. Go ahead. Is there, does anything special happen if omega k is equal to omega m? This could be an exercise. I would this say. cannot happen because omega matter plus omega k has, well, okay, it could happen if both of them are equal to a half this would be still valid. Uh, that's an interesting thing. I've never thought about it. I don't think anything interesting happens. It is a universe with, uh, with, uh, which always expands. So I don't think there's anything much more special than this. But I may be wrong. I will check. Uh, and if there is something interesting, I'll get back to you. OK. So now let's also, just for completeness and also to get something down in, you know, in, in terms of language, discuss distances in cosmology. Okay, this is an important topic, especially for, uh, for doing what is called cosmography, uh, which I will mention at the end. Uh, distances in cosmology are non-trivial because of the expansion of the universe. Okay, so even if I imagine a spatially flat universe, in which uh, the spatial part of the metric just looks like Euclidean space, which you know, you're used to dealing with in this room, for example, the presence of a scale factor which is changing with time means that you cannot apply the same logic uh, as you would, you know, you cannot apply the same formulae for distances and how distances change uh, between different objects, etc. Because uh, things are changing as a function of time. So you have to be a little bit careful. So what one does conventionally is to say that let's focus on what one can observe. This is Einstein's way of thinking. Okay, he used to, he used to say that uh, define all distances in terms of the propagation of light. That's a very clean way of defining distances. So that's the same thing that we will uh, do here. So imagine that there is a source of light and it is being seen by us at some uh, later time. So it emits at some time and we see it at some later time. How should I interpret the photons that I receive from this source in terms of a distance to this source? This is the question. So now, this can be done in a few different ways. There are two that I will talk about here. So, this is what I've said here. The expansion means that Euclidean notions need to be revised. So what one does is to say that 
let's use the Euclidean notions, but interpret them using observational quantities. Okay, observational and theoretically well understood quantities. So for example, okay, so for example, one theoretically well understood quantity would be photon counting. And the second one that we will apply is the propagation of light on an FLRW background. So ds squared equal to zero is the propagation of uh, null rays, which is what uh, we use to describe photons. And then we'll count photons that arise from, arrive from different parts of the, uh, of the universe. Okay, so mathematically, it's interesting to first define this quantity chi source, which is this integral c dt by a, which comes by just saying that, uh, you know, so imagine a universe with omega k equal to zero or k equal to zero. So the FLRW metric is just So I've not written the angular part because I want to describe a ray of light in which I have taken the origin to be me, for example, and the ray of light extends from the source to me. Or I can take the origin to be the source and the ray is extending radially to me. There's a question? Yes, yes, I think I mentioned that, that's right. Uh, yes, yes, you can set it to one if you want. Okay, so uh, I will be a little bit loose about uh, powers of C. So uh, dr squared I have kept because I want to describe radial distance. And the remaining things I can throw away because you can actually show that geodesics, photon geodesics, obey theta equal to, theta equal to constant and phi equal to constant in any coordinate system which is tied to fundamental observers in an FLRW space time. Okay, so my geodesic will follow from setting ds squared equal to zero. And uh, then what you will see is that this quantity dr in this case will just be related to this integral, c dt by a. Someone needs to be muted. John? <laughs> This is uh, comic relief provided by Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this integral uh, is the co-moving distance to the source. And the reason it is written here is because it is, it is implicitly a function of redshift. You see, because the source emits light at a certain time, which is T source. This light takes a certain, this amount of time, T source to T naught, in order to reach me. But I know that in the time that the light has come from the source to me, the wavelength of the photons has increased by some amount. That is captured by redshift. And I know that uh, redshift is related also to the scale factor. Okay, so I can use all of this knowledge and, in, and think of this co-moving distance to the source as a function of the observed redshift of the source. Redshift is an observed quantity. Okay, that's the reason it is so important. And here all I've done is to change variables. Instead of t, I am using the redshift of different different sources along the line of sight as a time variable. Okay, so remember that slide where I told you that redshifts, distances, and epochs in cosmology are all the same thing. You can just uh, you know, freely move from one concept to the other. So I'm just thinking of this, so t here, is related to the scale factor because if I know the evolution of the scale factor, A is a function only of T. So T is a function of A. Okay, so from the variable T, I can go to A as a clock. And A is related to the redshift in a very simple way in that expression that I gave you before. So from A, I can change also to redshift as a variable. And inside the integral, I have kept it as z prime. It's a dummy integration variable. And then the actual redshift of the source is sitting here in the integration limits. Okay, so although it looks simple, there is some thought that has to be put into un unpacking this kind of expression. But once you get your head around this, things become very interesting. Because, uh, okay, so here I have just shown you what happens when uh, k is non-zero. Don't worry about this. You can look at these slides later and understand what is happening. But once I have this uh, co-moving distance to the source, I can now define different kinds of distances to sources. This co-moving distance is a theoretical quantity. It has, it has chi as a function of z. 
Okay, so suppose you said that I want to use co-moving distance as my definition of distance. Fantastic. For a given source, what can I observe? For co-moving distance, the only thing I can observe is the redshift. So, so then in order to convert the, the redshift into co-moving distance, I need to know the cosmological model that I'm talking about. And maybe I don't know this model. Okay, maybe I want to infer what the model is. What is omega lambda? What is omega matter? I don't know this. So what do I do? So instead of using co-moving distance, I will define something that I say called the luminosity distance in the following way. Suppose I have a class of sources where in addition to the redshifts which I will observe from them, I also know what is their intrinsic luminosity, which is the amount of energy that they output per unit time at their location in their rest frame. Okay, if I have such a class of objects, these are called standard candles, and I know what their intrinsic luminosity is, then what I can go and do is this exercise. I will, I will use this knowledge of the intrinsic luminosity, and I will observe the flux that I get from these objects. The flux is just energy that I receive from the objects in uh, terms of photons per unit time, per unit area at my detector. Okay? So if I combine, uh, if I take this luminosity and flux in a Euclidean universe, they would be related to distance through this expression here. So I will declare that even in my FLRW universe, let me define this quantity. Wherever I see three lines like this, it's a definition and you're not allowed to ask any questions. Okay, that's the way this quantity is defined. So I can define this quantity DL. And now the theoretically interesting part comes in trying to understand this quantity DL as a function of redshift. And this is a exercise in photon counting and null geodesics, which you can find in, let's say, Narlikar's book. And you get this expression, okay? One plus Z times R source. You can, for the time being, just think of R source as being equal to this guy source. So now for a given cosmological model, I have a conversion between the uh, luminosity distance and the redshift. And the luminosity distance, crucially, is also an observed quantity because I know the intrinsic luminosity and I observe the flux. Okay, so this is how you break this degeneracy and you get rid of this dependence on the cosmological parameters or the cosmological model. And you can now go and plot, you can do what Hubble and Lemaitre did, and you can plot distances on one axis and redshifts on the other axis. Everything coming from observations. And this allows you to start constraining cosmological models. Okay, so this is one key thing which happened uh, in the 90s, which led to, for example, a Nobel Prize eventually for the discovery of the accelerating expansion of the universe. Another such distance that you can define is the angular diameter distance, which now, in, instead of luminosity, suppose I have objects which have fixed sizes, known sizes. Okay, so imagine if there was a class of galaxies uh, whose size in, the, in, in physical space is some fixed number, and I knew this number. Let's say I had a class of galaxies, each of them is 10 kiloparsecond diameter. What will happen now? If I take a 10 kiloparsec sized galaxy and I place it at one megaparsec from me, it will subtend some small angle at my eyes. If I take the same galaxy and I place it 100 megaparsec from me, it will subtend a smaller angle at my eyes, 100 times smaller. So I can use the angle subtended by this finite object, which is not a point anymore. I can use this angle, delta theta, and the knowledge of this intrinsic size of, the, of this object, if I have it, to define what is called the angular diameter distance. Same logic as before. In Euclidean geometry, this would be the unique distance to the object. If the angle is very small, I've ignored a sine or tangent. Uh, and now in FLRW, I simply define this to be the angular diameter distance. I do a photon counting exercise and uh, along with uh, geodesics, and I find that this dA is also related to this R source or chi source, but now with a different power of the uh, redshift appearing here. Okay, so the same logic that I could apply to luminosity distances, I can also apply to angular diameter distances. It's also interesting that the angular diameter distance is actually related to the luminosity distance without knowing about our source. Okay, both of them are linearly related to our source, so I can eliminate our source between them. And then dl is just uh, 1 plus z squared times dA. This is a very interesting relation. It is called, uh, I, I forget what it's called, cosmic duality or something like this. Uh, and it is something that is intrinsic to light propagation. It does not even care about which FLRW model you're using. Okay, so people try to test uh, this relation as well. 
Okay, I am going a bit slow. I have about, uh, what, 20 minutes? Okay. Okay. So uh, this is my last slide on distances. Uh, the reason is, uh, okay, so I wanted to point out a couple of interesting things here. One is that, so now you may think, okay, you know, luminosity distance, angular diameter distance, and then who knows how many other distances one can define. Uh, depends on how many properties of objects you're clever enough to extract from, uh, from your data. Uh, these are typically the ones that people use. But uh, it turns out that if I look at nearby objects, uh, you have to also ask what happened to the hubble lemaitre law. Okay. Theoretically, you can very easily show that at small distances or at small redshifts, z much less than 1, any definition of distance that you come up with will reduce to the linear relation. Okay, and it's as, as, here it's as simple as saying that you can tailor expand any smooth function of dl of z or da of z and there will be a linear term and uh, it will turn out that the proportionality constant of the linear term is always the same in each of these cases. There's a nicer way of doing this where you don't have to think about you know, which distance, why should the proportionality constant be the same. You can analyze photon uh, geodesics for nearby objects directly without asking whether I'm talking about luminosity distance or angular diameter distance. Just think about nearby objects and do photon propagation. The hubble lemaitre law will emerge naturally. And in fact, this is the calculation that Lemaitre proposed in his 1927 paper. Now, if I choose to think of this as in terms of Taylor expansion, what I can also do is to go to the next order of uh, power in Z, which is the quadratic power. And now I will have some second constant appearing here. So what I've shown you is a conventional way of writing the, the co-moving distance as a function of redshift at second order in Z. And this new constant Q0, it is related to the scale factor through the second de time derivative of the scale factor. So it's called the deceleration parameter. This is again a historical uh, you know, uh, uh, qu quirk where uh, people were not expecting this second derivative of the scale factor to be positive ever. Because in any universe where I have ordinary matter, non-relativistic or a relativistic bath of radiation, I expect that uh, because gravity is attractive, the scale factor of the universe through the acceleration equation will always remain negative. Okay, so that's why uh, the original definition of this Q was defined with a negative sign here, thinking that A double dot is anyway going to be negative. So you expect Q to be positive. It turned out in the mid 90s that observations of type 1a supernovae showed that this Q0, which is the value of Q at the current epoch, turns out to be uh, negative. So it indicates a positive acceleration of the, of the late time universe. Okay, and this exercise where notice that I just have two constants, the Hubble constant H0, which defines the linear relation, and this Q0, which is an additional constant related now to the second derivative. Nothing needs the knowledge of omega matter, omega radiation, omega. I don't need to tell you what is the energy density component uh, of the, such a universe. I am just using propagation of light and doing Taylor expansions. So this is a very interesting exercise called cosmography. And it is this exercise which if you interpret in a lambda CDM framework, you will infer the presence of a positive cosmological constant. In the cosmography framework, you would simply say that the discovery that Q0 is, uh, is negative says that the acceleration of the late time universe is, so the, uh, the second derivative is positive, okay, of A. Okay, so let me take uh, uh, like a brief pause and see if there are any questions because now it's the second part of the, uh, of the talk. Nothing so far. Anything from anyone in the room? Okay. All right, so with this setup, let me now go through a rapid review of what is called a standard model of cosmology. Since this is firstly the first lecture and also I want to give you a feel for everything that is there without going into technical details, I will mostly hand wave my way through the remaining part of the talk. Okay, so this is my first hand wave, it's a pie chart. And uh, it shows you the distribution of uh, matter in the late time universe in the standard model of cosmology. So the stuff that we are made of is the baryons, 
the, this forms about four to five percent of the energy density of the of the current universe. Uh, radiation, which is in the CMB, has such a small energy density today that you cannot even see it. But if you go back to the first slide of this talk, uh, I showed you uh, again an image stolen from uh, NASA's website, where uh, they show you this pie chart at two different epochs. Okay, so it gives you a feel for how energy densities evolved over time as well. A large chunk of non-relativistic matter is sitting in this uh, CD, this omega C for cold dark matter. I will talk about this in some detail as we go along. And most of the energy budget of the late universe is believed to sit in uh, a dark energy, which nobody really understands. Uh, it is for all practical purposes, as far as observations are concerned, it is still consistent with being a cosmological constant. Okay. Uh, neutrinos are also very interesting, maybe not for the kind of background cosmology that is indicated in this image, but for structure formation and for some interesting neutrino physics coming from cosmology. I will unfortunately not be discussing neutrinos here, but maybe if someone has uh, questions uh, during the discussion, one can bring it up. Okay, so this is again just in words, and also in terms of the Friedman equation, the components that we want to understand. And the theme of the remaining slides is to tell you observationally what do we know about these components. Okay, so I will emphasize the observational aspect here. I've just rewritten the Friedman equation here and I've introduced uh, these constants now. So earlier I had defined the omegas as the time dependent energy density of a particular component divided by the time dependent Hubble parameter and then Newton's constant, etc. Now I have used my knowledge of the uh, evolution of each individual energy density component in terms of the scale factor and I have converted from scale factor into powers of 1 plus z. Okay, and then uh, I still have some unknowns and these unknowns are now actually constants. They are dimensionless and they are constants. So I will put the subscript zero in front of all of them to tell you that they have been evaluated at time T0, which is current epoch. Okay, and I think I have been consistent with this notation in this and the coming slides. If I have not, and if you find that there is a place where you think I have written an omega matter, but it should be omega matter zero, you please raise your hand and immediately ask me because there may be interesting places where you think it should be omega m zero, but it actually has to be the time dependent quantity. Okay, so just pay attention. All right, so there are what? One, two, three, four constants in this equation plus one on the left hand side, which is the Hubble constant. Okay, so these five constants we will try to track now. The Hubble constant has had a very interesting history, starting from uh, Hubble's and Lemaitre's original papers uh, down to through the 60s and 70s, where it was the prime focus of cosmology. And now even down to today, where in the last five years or so, the problems with the Hubble constant have been revived, revived again, and there's a Hubble tension that you will read about in the literature. But I don't want to spend too much time on this, so I will just uh, say that the value is conventionally parameterized in these very strange looking units. They are strange until you realize the people who first wrote down this uh, linear relationship between distances and redshifts. They placed uh, velocities on the vertical axis and distances in megaparsec on the horizontal axis. So obviously the proportionality constant will be in kilometers per second per megaparsec. Okay, so that's the conventional unit for the Hubble constant. And uh, what one typically does is to characterize the uncertainty in the Hubble constant is to write it in units of 100 kilometers per second per megaparsec times a quantity little h, which is dimensionless, and its value is approximately 0 0.7 plus or minus 10% or 20% or so. And now with precision cosmology, the errors are going down to 4%, 3%. So variations of 10 to 20% are statistically very interesting. Okay, so, but uh, for, for me, I will just leave it at this. Okay, before I talk about the other four constants, uh, let me give you a crash course on what is called the thermal history of the universe. Okay, this is a one slide thermal history. It's truly unfortunate because the thermal history of the universe is something that should be given an entire course of four or five lectures, but uh, we cannot do this. So uh, let me hand wave my way through this. What one is dealing with in the hot Big Bang framework is an early phase of the universe where if the universe is expanding and it has a large size today, an expanding universe would have been smaller and denser in the past. Okay, a dense universe is also hot, therefore hot 
Big Bang. Big Bang because if you, you know, extrapolate all the way down to very early times, you will find a place where formally the scale factor becomes zero and curvatures blow up, uh, Einstein's equations fail, and you don't know what to do there. So then that becomes the realm of quantum gravity. Uh, so the, and the, 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 the epoch at which classically A of t becomes zero is called the Big Bang. Okay, there's a very interesting history for why the name was invented as well. But at later times, when we do understand some physics of, uh, of atoms and photons and atomic interactions with photons and nuclear interactions, uh, this is the epochs that we will discuss. And at this time, there are, uh, there are, you know, there are components like free electrons, protons uh, hanging around in this cosmic bath. There are photons which are interacting with these electrons and protons. And everything is interacting with gravity because gravity obviously affects matter. Gravity also affects photons through lensing and uh, by changing the wavelengths of light. Okay? So, uh, and in addition to this stuff which we understand, we also think that there is a dark matter. Why we think there's a dark matter, I will talk about in the coming slide. So in such a universe, which is expanding, the temperature of this hot bath falls as a function of time. And again, there is a very simple theory that will tell you that if I track the distribution of photons, which is described very well by a black body, the temperature of this black body in an expanding universe will behave like 1 over A, approximately all the time. There are interesting times when it will not behave like 1 over A, which I will not discuss here. All these species are interacting with each other. Okay, so here I'm showing you atomic interactions. The same thing at earlier times you can apply to nuclear interactions as well. A proton and a proton combining, a proton and a neutron combining to form deuterium, for example. Okay, similar kind of things will happen there. So species which are interacting with each other will have some interaction rates. And if these rates are very rapid relative to the expansion of the universe, so if the rates gamma are much larger than the expansion factor H, then these interactions will remain in equilibrium. Okay, so this is the key idea that, uh, that one follows when studying the thermal history. And after this point, the, that particular reaction will, in this jargon, decouple from the rest of the bath. So the thermal history of the universe is marked by several interesting epochs where one after the other, certain interactions fall out of equilibrium and decouple from the rest of the bath. Neutrinos are a classic example, for example, and uh, electrons and po positrons annihilating is another example. So for example, so for this particular case with electrons and positrons annihilating or other, other species which might annihilate, uh, such species, their number density can completely disappear from the rest of the bath. Okay, positrons, for example, will behave like this. And uh, this will also do interesting things to the remaining bath because once I have annihilations, annihilation means that, for example, an electron and a positron come together and release photons. These photons now become part of the photon bath. But now there are no more photons left to create positrons and electrons because the reaction rates have fallen. Uh, to substantial amounts. So these photons are now excess photons and they create, they create an excess amount of entropy which is then shared with the rest of the bath. In fact, this is, these are the epochs where T will not exactly fall like 1 over A. Okay, so I know I'm going fast, it's deliberate. You can ask me questions on this later. The other interesting set of things that happens in this uh, plasma or fluid of photons and baryons is that uh, this fluid supports sound waves because these species, electrons, protons, and photons, are very tightly coupled to each other. Okay, so this whole combination behaves like a relativistic fluid, and a relativistic fluid can support sound waves with a speed approximately c by root 3. Okay, so these sound waves, for some reason, in a homogeneous and expanding universe, homogeneous and isotropic universe, if for some reason sound waves are created at some early epoch, these sound waves will propagate, okay? And why they are created and what causes that is the subject of the initial conditions which will be handled in the lectures on inflation. But for us, let's just assume that there is some cause for creating, for pinging this fluid at some initial time. Because it can support sound waves, these sound waves will propagate. And now physics tells us that this propagation will happen up to a certain epoch. It turns out to be around 400,000 years after the Big Bang. The reason this epoch is interesting is because by this time, the universe has cooled to such an amount that electrons and protons which become a hydrogen atom don't see any high energy photons which have energies more than 13.6 eV to come and ionize them. 
Okay, so I have this particular reaction at very high temperatures can go in both directions. I can have electrons and protons becoming a hydrogen atom. And if the universe is very hot, then there are many high energy photons available. And eventually a hydrogen atom will meet a high enough energy photon that it will get ionized and again release electrons and protons. So this reaction remains in equilibrium at early times. Around 400,000 years after the Big Bang, the temperature of the universe is so low that there are very, very few high energy photons available now. Okay? Only in the tail of the distribution and even that tail is rapidly uh, disappearing. So now when an electron and proton come together, they'll form a hydrogen atom which is neutral and it will not get ionized anytime soon. So now the universe starts filling up with these neutral atoms and electrons uh, so, and photons cannot talk to neutral objects, okay, to neutral, uh, neutral quantities. They can only talk to charge quantities. So the photons that are now hanging around all these low energy photons will simply go along the geodesics on which they are traveling. And they will keep going and keep going until they meet your telescope or your instrument or your eyes. Okay, so these are free streaming photons which will go as far as they can. This is the bath of photons that you see around you. This is the cosmic microwave background. And therefore the cosmic microwave background is a snapshot of the universe as it was 400,000 years, 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Okay, so this is a very, very important physical uh, point to remember. So this particular epoch goes by several names. It is called recombination because uh, electrons and protons combine. Actually, they combine for the first time into hydrogen. It is called photon decoupling because these photons don't see any charge carriers anymore and they free stream. Sometimes it is also called the epoch of last scattering because this is the last time that photons scattered with, uh, with uh, electrons. Also, before this epoch, there was a photon baryon fluid. So the baryons were also connected to the photons, okay? And they were participating in these oscillations or these sound waves. Once the photons free stream, there is nothing to support the, the oscillations anymore uh, or the sound waves. And these baryons are now just going to respond to gravity. By this point, the electrons and protons are completely non-relativistic. So this is a non-relativistic bath of matter which is going to respond to gravity. And whatever the local gravitational potential is doing, these baryons will go and uh, follow it. Okay? So uh, I wanted to spend some time here because uh, this aspect will be important later when we study structure formation. So just to summarize, these freed photons, they free stream to us with a black body shape of their spectrum, even though they are not in equilibrium, you can prove that their spectrum remains a black body with a temperature that falls like one over A. Okay, so this is not a equilibrium temperature. It is now just a parameter describing the distribution of these photons, which behaves like one over A and it becomes 2.7 Kelvin today. This is the CMB. And these baryons locally will eventually condense and form galaxies. But uh, the oscillations that happened before, they will leave imprints in the spatial distribution of these galaxies. And these are now observed in the late time universe as what is called baryon acoustic oscillations. Okay. All right. So I think I'm running out of time, but maybe I will... Five minutes? Okay. So I will go a little bit rapidly over uh, some of these aspects, but I will spend a little bit of time on dark matter because uh, I wanted to do that in a, in a little bit properly. So we are now discussing the individual constants, omega r0, omega k0, etc. Okay, so the first one is radiation. This can be understood in terms of uh, a black body spectrum. And you can see here observations of this black body spectrum from the Kobe uh, satellite, the FIRAS instrument aboard Kobe. And the interesting thing here is that these error bars are 400 times magnified. Okay, so it is the most perfect black body known to human beings. You cannot produce such a black body in the lab. Uh, and the temperature of this black body is what was measured with very high precision. And it gives you a direct handle through conversion into the energy density on the constant omega r0. Okay, so these numbers are given here. You can take a look at them later. Baryons, until very recently, were primarily probed by what is called predictions of Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So these are very interesting calculations in the framework of the thermal history of the universe, which were performed in the 50s and 60s uh, by several people, including George Gamow and, and his collaborators. And uh, these so there are these theoretical predictions for what the primordial densities of 
a certain nuclear species should look like. And the reason there must be non-zero values of these species is because of the physics of decoupling of reactions. Okay, the, so the reactions involving these species would eventually decouple based on our knowledge of nuclear physics. And those are the uh, predictions that one used to write down what one expects. And then, uh, so there are these theoretical curves in different colors. All of them are parameterized by the overall baryon density of the universe. So the quantity omega b0. Okay, and this is the way the theory works. And what is shown in the boxes are individual measurements of these primordial uh, components. These measurements are also very interesting. Again, you can ask me later on how each of them is done. And what one can see from this image is that more or less all of them are consistent with this blue band. So all the black boxes are consistent with this blue band where they each intersect the corresponding theoretical curve. So this blue band therefore gives you a prediction for omega b0 uh, coming from Big Bang nucleosynthesis. And uh, until very recently, as in by recently I mean until like uh, 20 years ago or so, this was what one would call precision cosmology. Okay, 10% errors on omega b0. Uh, today we have much more precise measurements from uh, CMB studies, but the original BBN constraints are completely consistent with uh, the constraints coming from CMB, even though the latter are 10 times better than these. Okay, we are at 1% precision now. In addition to the ordinary non-relativistic matter, which is baryons, we also believe that the dominant non-relativistic matter today is in the form of cold dark matter. So let me spend a few minutes on why this is the case. Okay, so the way cold dark matter is understood is that it is a non-baryonic component, number one. Number two, it is non-relativistic for most of cosmic history. All right. And its dominant interaction with ordinary matter and radiation is through gravity. And the reason we think that these things are correct is because otherwise, the CMB anisotropies which you saw earlier, I showed you that CMB anisotropies are at the level of one part in 10 to the five. If I interpret these anisotropies in terms of the density fluctuations of matter, and radiation of that photon baryon plasma. These fluctuations are also at the level of one part in 10 to the five. What we will see in the third lecture is that the growth of structure in linear or quasi-linear theory from that epoch, 400,000 years after the Big Bang to today will only produce uh, evolution in the density contrasts of matter of the order of 10 to the power three or 10 to the power four at most at scales where we see that the CMB has 10 to the minus five fluctuations. Okay, so let me just write this down. So I expect 10 to the three to 10 to the four growth at scales where the CMB tells me that there are 10 to the minus five fluctuations in the initial conditions. There is a factor of 10 to 100 missing in this accounting. And there is no way that you can understand this factor without introducing a species which has not been talking to the photons, okay, and it has not been talking to the baryons, but it has been gravitating at the time of the CMB. Because only then can you create gravitational potentials which are deep enough that they will account for the excess that is missing from 10 to the power minus 5 to 1. Okay, so this, uh, this is the relative growth. So what I should say is that uh, this is the relative growth uh, expected. And this, so 10 to the minus five fluctuations and therefore 10 to the five growth expected. This is theoretically, this is observationally. Okay. So as far as I understand, this is the most robust evidence that there must be a species of non-baryonic matter which does not interact with photons. Therefore, it should be collision, collision-less dark matter. Dark because you cannot see it, otherwise uh, if it interacted with photons, you would see it. Uh, and it should also be non-relativistic for most of history. Otherwise, it would have, its fluctuations would have wiped out the fluctuations that you see in the CMB. So there used to be hot dark matter models which were very early ruled out once the spectrum of uh, fluctuations on the CMB was discovered. Okay, so there is a lot of uh, sometimes confusion uh, regarding what is the most robust evidence of dark matter. As far as I understand, this is it. 
There are several other pieces of evidence historically which were used to argue for the presence of dark matter. Uh, the very first that I think uh, was done was by Fritz Zwicky in the early 1930s, where he used the virial theorem to argue that observations of galaxy clusters are inconsistent with the number of stars that you see in the galaxies forming these clusters. Okay, so uh, what he did was to apply the virial theorem to velocity dispersions of these galaxies and infer the dynamical mass from these velocities by applying the virial theorem. This mass turned out to be a factor 50 larger than the mass that he counted in the stars. And he is the one who invented this term dark matter, Dunkelmatter in, in German, I think. Uh, later observations of these galaxy clusters showed that there is in, actually a lot of mass contained in gas which would not be visible in the optical, but which is visible in X-rays. This is very hot gas emitting in X-rays. But even this amount of gas falls short of the total dynamical mass by a factor of 10 or so. So the missing mass problem in clusters is consistent with there being dark matter. In the 70s, there were observations first done by Vera Rubin uh, of uh, rotation curves of galaxies. And this is the classic thing which we learn usually as students, where rotation curves becoming flat where it can be interpreted in terms of uh, the presence of dark matter. The problem is you, with using this as the only evidence for dark matter is that there are alternate theories, which you may rule out for on other grounds, uh, such as MOND, where, there, where flat rotation curves will be predicted. They are con almost constructed to be, to be produced. As far as I know, again, MOND has a lot of trouble with, uh, with this statement here. Okay, so this is one interesting fact. Scale-dependent master light, let me not talk about. Uh, Bullet-like clusters is another uh, thing which was uh, proposed and it became very popular. Uh, two things to keep, it, keep track of. So what is the idea here? You see the gas of a cluster. You see the stars of the galaxies of a cluster. Now you look for clusters which have collided with each other. And in this case, the gas and the stars are separated from each other because the gas is collisional and the stars are collisionless. Now you do weak lensing observations, weak gravitational lensing, and you trace out the mass distribution inferred from these lensing observations. And what you find is that this mass distribution shown by the contours is different from the gas, but it kind of coincides with the stars. So this is again consistent with saying that there is a dark component uh, which must be collisionless. There were again issues related to this. Firstly, this is just one object. That part has gone away. There are now many such objects known, bullet-like clusters. Uh, the other problem is that there are non-relativistic extensions of modern-like theories which do produce such images. Okay? They may not do it as well and they may be very complicated, but you can't say that this is the only way of doing it. Again, these kind of uh, theories will not be able to, to produce the CMB anisotropies. And it's a very simple argument. It's just an order of magnitude which is, which is missed. So that's why it's so robust. Okay. Cosmological constant is something that, uh, that has now been established. Uh, well, the, a cosmological constant-like component has been established primarily by cosmography of standard candles such as type 1a supernovae. So again, I will not talk about this in detail, but uh, this is a, a, a measurement which was given the Nobel Prize. All right, so let me not say too much more here, but uh, things are observations are consistent with there being a cosmological constant with a value of omega lambda of about uh, 0.7. Spatial curvature is very interesting. It is very tightly constrained by the cosmic microwave background anisotropies. So these are things that I will, I think, discuss a little bit later, and maybe you will have a course on this next week. Uh, the location of the first peak here which I have not described to you, but you can just think of whatever these measurements are. They are a function of angular scale, okay, inverse angular scale. And the location of this peak is like a standard ruler in the sky. This is the typical scale over which CMB and isotropies fluctuate in the sky. So this standard ruler subtends an angle to us, which is about one degree in observations. So if I apply my logic of angular diameter distances, I can try to constrain uh, the corresponding cosmological parameters. And the primary one now that can be constrained is a combination of the curvature and the Hubble parameter. If you try to infer the value of the Hubble parameter from some other probe, or now also consistently with the CMB, you will find that there's a very tight constraint on the value of K, where if I made K very positive, I would move this peak in one direction. With negative K, I would move it in the other direction. So the observation gives me the value of omega K. It turns out to be very close to zero. Okay. So uh, 
this is just a plot of uh, the standard model and the expansion of energy density, the total energy density of the universe in the standard model. So I think I will just uh, leave you with this. Different components are shown and you can see how they, enter, how they behave relative to each other. Uh, I'll stop here. Okay, thank you, Asim. Yes, so uh, since we are a bit late, maybe we can uh, keep the questions for the for the discussion session. So now I think we. Where is the break on the terrace, right? I guess we have upstairs on the terrace. There will be a, a coffee break for those who are present. Thank you. See you at eleven fifteen.